Hello, everybody. Very warm welcome to this uh, conversation about the participation, political participation of young people. Uh, we have had a huge success apparently with this topic among the applicants and we are very sorry that um, not everyone could be involved in the event itself. But we do hope that among you there are other people also who are interested in the topic. It seems to be a very relevant issue, I think, for an understandable um, set of reasons that Christina will raise in a moment in her presentation. In the youth partnership between the European Commission and the Council of Europe in the field of youth, we have been working on the topic of youth participation for several years now. And we thought it is time to go back to uh, this focus on political nature of the participation. Um, as uh, we will discuss it shortly. To see where we are, what kind of forms exist, what they are linked to, but also the creativity and all the strength that is available in this field uh, in Europe and possibly beyond and see where we want to head with it. And we hope that the symposium will be an occasion for it, but also the preceding webinars. Um, and this is the very first one of them. So again, a very warm welcome. Uh, I will not uh, like to take more space, but give it to your questions and to Christina's presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Marta. Uh, so now uh, I, I, I pass uh, the, the word to, to, to Christina, but first I would like to, to, to introduce her. Christina, uh, currently she, she works as an independent research consultant uh, and a member of the pool of the European uh, Youth Re Researchers. And uh, she, she has been working in the field for 12 years uh, right, right now, working with uh, the various institutions from the government uh, of uh, Canada to the Commonwealth and to the Youth Policy Labs, which is a global think tank, and she she confessed me that she didn't jump uh, in the in the topic uh, randomly. Actually, when uh, when she she was a, a young a young girl, a student, she was already campaigning for global human rights issues. Uh, on, on the campus where she, she was studying and uh, she was also engaged as a youth leader being uh, a youth advisory council being part of the youth a chair of the youth advisory council for a national NGO in Canada and uh, she also confessed uh, that uh, when she was working as a, an intern for, for, the, for the United Nations she was one of the activists against the uh, unpaid internships that were going on. So, Christine um, challenged you to, to bring an object uh, and to tell us a bit besides this, uh, this, uh, this idea of uh, being uh, an activist before you engage as a researcher and being a researcher, to bring an, uh, an object to share with the participants and to start the, the discussion and your, your presentation on uh, why uh, it's important and what are the models over there out there uh, where young people are engaging in political life uh, to to share with us so can can you share with us the object and uh, i i give you the the floor to explain why why it's important and why did you bring this this object to start the, the discussion with us Sure, thank you so much, um, Anna, for, for the introduction, very nice introduction. Uh, my object is actually this, which is a light bulb, of course, and we can think of a light bulb as representing many things, ideas, that sort of thing, but is actually also a stress ball. <laughs> I think uh, for me, this really sort of signifies um, the, kind of, um, the kind of work uh, which we do as youth researchers and, uh, and people working in um, the youth field is that we really are spending a lot of time in kind of conceptual space, but we really are also doing kind of the hard work, which, which often causes a lot of stress in terms of thinking about uh, what uh, these ideas, these concepts mean for, for people's lives. Um, I'm going to start uh, the presentation here and today, um, let me see, share screen and uh, 
Today I'll be speaking about um, the, does everybody see okay the presentation? Yes, I'm assuming so. Yes, um, is it, uh, uh, Leonis, is it fine actually? Or can you still see this, uh, this window here? Yeah, it's all good. Okay, great. Um, super, okay. So, oh, just to go back for a second. So uh, today we're going to be talking about current debates on youth political participation uh, at a time of change and uncertainty in Europe. Um, I chose the, the title uh, for this, um, this webinar uh, to be on purpose uh, slightly provocative. I, I wanted to, to kind of to light people on fire a bit and also to use the metaphor that uh, Greta Thunberg, of course, who uh, is the young climate activist from Sweden, uh, her own metaphor, our house is on fire. Um, she, of course, used this uh, in relation to uh, speaking about the, um, the current uh, climate crisis and the uh, planet literally warming up. But also, I thought that this was quite an apt um, metaphor for where we are um, in Europe and in, in the world today. Um, we have a lot of challenges, you know. Uh, we, we do have the existential crisis, of course, of climate change, but we also see a lot of rising youth unemployment. We see a lot of rising inequality in our societies and a lot of social exclusion um, of various groups within our societies, uh, of course, uh, notwithstanding young people themselves. But why are we talking about youth participation at this particular moment? Um, are things perhaps any more difficult than they were in previous generations in previous times? Are we at an, a moment of, of historic change or is this, you know, kind of par for the course? And I think it's, it's quite interesting actually for us to talk about youth political participation at this moment because it's, it's very interesting. We actually see that young people are perhaps in the spotlight more than ever before. Um, I don't think I need to introduce any of these uh, young women here but they all um, have been occupying our, um, our, uh, our TV screens. And, um, oops. And I, I think that, um, oops, sorry, I'm just going to, oh, pardon me. I'm just going to stop for a moment. I'm having some difficulty. Sorry for that. Uh, escape sorry i will go back to that in a moment there was some problem with the navigation let's start again here there we are so we we know that young people are kind of occupying the the discourse and the conversation more than ever before and so i think that this is a really interesting does it mean to for young people to do so? Um, I'm going to ask a three questions. They're actually in the format of, um, of quotes. I'm going to put three quotes onto the screen here. And I would like everybody to use their chat windows and tell me if you agree, disagree, I don't know, something like that. Um, it's not meant to be a scientific poll, it's just to kind of get a sense of people's feelings around the table. So if you can open up your chat window, there should be a, bottom, um, a button at the bottom there for you, um, and you can uh, take a look at your chat. And uh, we're going to look at this first quote. So this first quote is, overall, I Jenners, so that's the kind of term for young people these days that this author uses. I Jenners want to contribute but are not as inclined to take action. Apparently, they agree that altruism is important but have trouble following through. I Jenners may grow into adults who are skilled at forwarding links about worthy causes but are not as skilled as actually getting involved. So I'm curious to see um, what some of the um, feedback is there and we will come back to this topic um, of political participation online does it mean that young people are really participating or is it just an easy way to participate um, and this is the the author for this particular quote here um, great so just if you can kind of put some of your ideas 
in the chat box there. Unfortunately, I cannot see the chat box here, but I trust that your ideas are being logged in and we'll come back to that as, as a moment of sharing. Um, Maybe I can, because I, I can see Christina some of the, the, the answers. Perfect, so yes. Most of the people until now disagree. There is someone 70% agreeing, another one agreeing. Super. Um, so agree, agree, disagree. Mm -hmm. uh, so it seems to be balanced, but I would say that uh, most of the people are, are disagreeing. But Super. That's very interesting. So we, so we already have an a issue which is kind of split among uh, the group okay. here. No, we, we suddenly got uh, two, two agrees. So we, yeah. Great. I'll move on uh, to the next question now then, uh, the next quote. And, and then we have a, a comment on someone saying that is a bit general to capture the diversity and uh, someone disagreeing explaining that it's difficult may not be to take action but to do in so in established structures we get involved in non-conventional way and that i genders are very heterogeneous uh, group so these there are some elaborations on the on the answers Super. And we're already getting to talk about some of the different ways in which young people participate, some of the different styles, and we'll, we'll come back to this concept in a moment. Uh, so for the second quote that I'll put up here. Um, what authorities are failing to recognize is that these strikes are a demand for democracy from young people because without having the right to vote, their only way of making public demands and influencing policy is through civil disobedience and taking to the streets. That said, the most effective way to help young people defend their rights and demand climate action is having the right to vote. And this is the author here. So some initial comments or reactions or uh, agree, disagree, don't know, somewhere in the middle. Totally agree, absolutely disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Agree. So the disease, the people disagreeing are the are typing now. So I would say that so far. A comment of someone that agrees with the first part, with agrees it partially. The first part mm -hmm. is okay, the second one not. <laughs> So far, most of the people disagree. Super. And so it's, we can already see how a lot of these ideas are, are quite contentious. You know, it's, there's no easy way to talk about participation. Quote that we have. We also need to respect the right not to participate. And this is the author here. Some, some ideas about this as well. So do you agree? Do you disagree? Most of the people are agreeing with uh, this last sentence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So far, no one disagreed. Someone is putting a focus on the intentions for not engaging. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so most of the people agree, agreed. Super. And so this also comes into this idea, the person who mentioned about intentions, in terms of what does it mean when young people don't participate? Does that necessarily mean that they're not interested or is the act of not participating uh, a political act itself? So this just demonstrates how kind of difficult it is actually to talk about political participation. We don't necessarily have a, a kind of unified way necessarily of thinking about it of 
of talking about these terms, um, what's good, what's bad, uh, and in terms of, of all of it, this is quite contentious, you know, and so what do we mean when we talk political participation? So just to start, the Council of Europe uh, and European uh, Union uh, Youth Partnership Glossary and Youth does have a definition, a very general definition for political participation, which they say is any activity that shapes, affects, or involves the political sphere. But of course, you know, the questions of this are, what are these activities? What do they look like? What do we consider to be political? You know, is um, the way that we choose to buy products a political act, or is it not? Um, so, of course, we can see that, you know, definitions are, are difficult in this in this case we can think though very broadly speaking of participation as a whole and not specifically just political participation but overall participation as a whole as being every opportunity in space where young people have an influence and that is really an influence on anything that affects their lives on policies on decisions on discourses or even relationships of course here we're talking about this political sphere and I think part of the conversation now is what do we consider to be political? But it is really simply about um, agency, young people having agency, expressing their views, having influence, and also increasing control over their lives. Why do we talk about definitions? Well, definitions are important because they reflect values, ideas on, on society, and also power dynamics. They also tell us you know, in defining something, what are we excluding? What ways of seeing and understanding are we not speaking about? And definitions also set the agenda. Uh, they uh, influence policy, they influence practice and youth work practice, for example, as well as how resources are allocated. So the way in which we talk about what is considered to be political participation has a large influence on the lives of young people and the youth policies that we design for them. So my question for this, this presentation in general, though, is do we have a crisis? Is it a crisis of participation? Uh, we know that you know, our house is on fire. There's so much happening in Europe right now. We're confronted, like Anna said in the beginning, with various confront, conflicting messages about the way in which young people are participating. Does this constitute a crisis or does it not? Do we have a crisis? And if so, what is it of? I'm going to go through just a couple examples of some ways in which people have thought, yes, we do have a crisis. Uh, there, young people need to change. There are things about the way in which young people are participating which are troubling, and this is what we need to look at. So, for example, um, of course, everybody, I'm sure, has heard this, uh, this term, and Anna mentioned in the beginning, slacktivism. You know, so one of the things that we hear um, foremost from the talking heads on the news and parental uh, advisory groups and this sort of thing is that young people spend way too much time on their telephones. Uh, if they're uh, engaging in politics, it's simply a matter of liking something on Facebook, sharing a, a post on uh, Twitter, or changing their avatar on uh, Instagram. So political participation. You know, what we would want to promote and to consider as being political particip participation from young people. And what I would say is that actually, let's look at the research. And a little bit of this presentation is to kind of look a little bit at the research. Um, we, there is a study that was undertaken in 2018, which was a meta-analysis of looking at 100 studies over the past 20 years of surveys of about 85,000 85, young people uh, around the globe. And it was looking at this link between um, using digital media, uh, engaging on social media, and what that means for participation in so-called offline activities. Does this actually translate to uh, higher political participation? Well, what the researchers found is actually that online activities positively correlated with offline activities. They found that young people who were engaging online were often more likely to be engaging uh, in political activities which would be in their real lives. They would be contacting officials, perhaps engaging in boycotts or, or protesting. Um, the activity online was seen as part and parcel 
of their growing awareness of the issues, of their way to be able to link with like-minded people who also felt the same about the issues and really became the, um, the type of catalyst that they needed in order to, to feel that they could uh, take some action and, and to, to act on the streets. And so it's interesting to see that, you know, okay, we have this one um, type of, um, of discourse, which is happening in the media, but yet when we think and when we look at science, what does it really tell us? What does the research tell us about uh, young people and their habits and, and how this uh, plays out in real life? Another um, typical uh, worry about young people in political engagement is that there is a lower engagement in traditional party politics. Uh, you know, we do see uh, lower levels of uh, young people um, registering to vote or being um, or voting at all. We see uh, less membership in party politics and parties or in um, in unions. And the typical uh, reasons for this that people will um, will perhaps. Uh, uh, claim to is that young people are simply apolitical, they're indifferent, or simply they're apathetic. And so again, too, I think it's, it's useful for us to think a little bit about uh, and to look at what does the research say? What has some of, um, of our colleagues in, in universities and, and research institutes, what have they looked at in terms of this? And we have another study from 2013, uh, which looked at um, a large scale survey um, uh, in Europe on youth uh, participation in democratic life. And we know that, for example, 44% of the young people who did not go to vote, um, even though they were eligible to vote, their main reason was actually simply because no candidate or party um, that was on the ballot was simply um, one that they wanted to vote for. You know, they, this is simply a lack of, of options. Uh, you know, in that sense, why bother to vote if no one on the ballot is really, you know, speaking to you or representing your interests? Um, similarly, in, the, in a more recent uh, study on the EU referendum, um, we had actually a lot of data uh, going around in um, survey data that was reported in uh, the news, in the mainstream media in, um, in the UK about how young people were partly to blame for the Brexit um, outcome because they simply did not show up to vote. But actually what we find when we look more at the data and control for uh, those who are registered, that actually young people did turn out to vote. Um, and actually at rates roughly similar to, to those of the national average. And so what we see is that, you know, young people are kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. They either, you know, are blamed for being apathetic because they don't want to vote, even though perhaps there's no choices. And even when they do vote, they don't necessarily get the credit for voting or are rec um, representative of, um, are being represented uh, in, um, in a positive light when they um, when they're spoken about in the media and so you know we see that when it comes to things like voting this is this is kind of the situation for a lot of young people so you know how is it then that young people do really participate uh, we do have a uh, very interesting study that i would really um, um, encourage everybody on this call to, to take a look at, which is called Part to Space. And this was an EU funded study under Horizon 2020. That was a three year long study uh, that really looked at uh, the ways and forms and styles of how young people um, participate. And this is both participate concept of what political participation expert interviews and group discussions in eight cities. Uh, it was um, made up of, of 48 different case studies and also had an element of participatory action research uh, with young people. And what did they find out? Well, they, what they found is that actually the ways in which young people participate are actually much perhaps much different than our narrow conception of what political participation is. Uh, some young people were living in social um, alternatives as, um, as different political models. So for example, uh, in squats or even through lifestyle choices such as uh, eating vegan as a way of um, expressing uh, their own position on, um, on climate change. Uh, they saw that young people were producing and negotiating their own spaces in terms of the way that they use spaces in urban centers and how uh, that was really sort of a claim for them to say this is this is our lives, this is how we choose to live, and this is also how we feel uh, public space should be used. And also uh, a lot of um, young people 
who engage in NGOs and, and volunteers and as part of service of humanity and, uh, and in service enterprise. And here you can see that, you know, now we're starting to slightly bend this concept of, of political particip participation. And let's think about maybe what that means to bend it. Um, what was uh, central though, is that a lot of the young people in the ways in which they participate, the styles of participation was really because young people were defining issues that were important for themselves. And this was often different from issues that adults find important. So a lot of young people um, from, you know, when they go to a ballot box or they look at the political parties, they don't see their issues represented. They don't see the politicians talking about the things that are important to them. So they then choose for themselves, how is it that I am going to express myself regarding climate change? How is it that I'm going to, through the way that I am living, express my, my political position? Um, an interesting um, point, um, an interesting uh, section in the research as well, looks at how young people learn um, participation. And this really reflects on, you know, some different insights uh, that, that they had from all of, um, from speaking to young people directly and, and through the research. Uh, they also reflected that young people had, uh, when they had the experience of being recognized as an active person, that that was often the most powerful experience uh, for them that fueled participation. And what does that mean to be recognized? For them, being recognized meant uh, to have the opportunity to speak out, to be active, and to exercise their rights. So to really do participation in practice. And for them, that was more important than actually receiving citizenship education or information on participation opportunities. They found that young people, when they learned to participate, it wasn't actually about needing extra programs. So one of uh, the focus of the research was looking, for example, at democratic schools. A lot of democratic schools would talk the talk of participation, of um, de democratic citizenship and all these sorts of things, but hardly ever walk the walk in the sense of how teachers themselves um, integrate or, or interact with young people, how decisions are being made that affect young people and uh, the, um, the degree to which they would have an impact on that. So one of their main findings was also that participation doesn't necessarily need extra programs. Um, every opportunity where a decision is made about a young person's life um, has the, um, uh, pro um, provides an opportunity for participation uh, to, to arise in that. In, and that essentially means that when we think about part participation, it's really relational between the young person and the so-called power holder, the adult, often, in often case. And, um, and every kind of moment in everyday life, young people are able to participate. So when we think about you know, this, uh, this overall research, when we think, okay, you know, young people, perhaps they are participating. We see them being involved in, in various different ways that sure, maybe we lacked a bit in terms of our narrow description of participation. Uh, if we expand our, our definition of political participation, we actually see young people in every corner uh, participating in some sort of way, whether it's through their lifestyle, through uh, online or these other sorts of mechanisms. So where is the crisis? And I think the question really, you know, I think that we still do have some pretty big problems. We have young people who are expressing themselves, but yet are the adults listening? You know, and this is an example here. Um, this is in the United States from Diane Feinstein uh, when she is being approached by um, the Sunrise Movement, which are the climate activists. You know, they, they come to her office. Kids, listen, I've been doing this for 30 years. I know what I'm doing. And you know, this kind of dismissive sort of response, this lack of recognition of young people as being legitimate political actors, I think is still part of the problem. Uh, what we have here, you know, is something that perhaps would not happen if an oil lobbyist came into that office, or perhaps if other types of professionalized uh, activists came into that, that office. But yet, when young people do, you know, this is, this is how she dismisses them. Does not engage at the level of ideas, but actually engages with them as if they're children. And I think that this is something for us to keep in mind that we still confront often. 
we also have a crisis of legitimacy. You know, young people are turning their backs on traditional, uh, traditional structures. And I think that, you know, this is really then not so much a crisis of young people, but perhaps a crisis of our structures. You know, the way in which our societies are organized, the structures in which we've built, why is it that young people are, are turning away? And I think that then really the questions become reflexive for ourselves. You know, it's, it, I think that then we turn the questions on their head instead of, for example, in the screen time debate or in the slacktivism debate, instead of asking, how can we get these young people off their damn screens? Perhaps the question is, what are young people really doing on their screens? What is it that they're engaging with? Are there things that we can learn from how they're doing it that we simply just don't understand? Maybe they actually do have real life ramifications and we just brush it off as being a waste of time. Instead of asking, why don't young people vote? Perhaps we should better ask, why can't more politicians get young people to vote for them? Instead of asking, how can we teach young people to respect our institutions? We should ask, what is it about our institutions that is causing young people to lose trust in them? And lastly, instead of asking, what skills do young people need to participate? Maybe we need to turn the question around. What skills do adults need to, uh, to listen? And can they handle their decisions being challenged? So these are not meant to be questions that can be answered, but I think it's perhaps a starting point for us to be reflexive in terms of thinking about when we talk about political participation, who are we talking about? What are the questions we need to ask ourselves? And with that, I would just like to close and uh, to now also open the floor for conversation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you, Christina. Uh, what, uh, what an interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I think that we, we got uh, two questions here in the Q&I questions. Um, so uh, the first question I think that more or less was, uh, was uh, addressed on the challenges that young people face in the aspect. So this was basically uh, the, the topic itself to, to explore a bit the challenges also that young people and institutions are, are, are facing in this aspect. Uh, there is one here related with, the, with this legitimacy aspect and uh, the lack of options that you mentioned that young people are bringing, which is related with the, uh, the democracy system itself. So on the representative democracy, the question says, is it a crisis on representative democracy on once all three women provoked participative democracy in a kind of a non-established organization. So it was uh, raised by Maria do Carmo Pinheiro Torres. Uh, so Maria, also if you want to be more specific on the, on the question, maybe you can uh, unmute yourself uh, or you can also type it in the chat window. I will check if Maria is uh, with, uh, with us, if uh, after the presentation she still has. This question, Maria? Maria do Carmo Pinheiro Torres, I think she's here. You, you can do, you can unmute on the bottom of your window. On the left, you have like the mic. If you are using a PC, you have like the a mic and then you can mute or unmute yourself. And you can take the floor and be more specific to, to raise. And also, Limanus can unmute you, actually. Yeah, I did, but I think we cannot hear Maria. So perhaps uh, Christina can answer based on the yeah. question. Uh, 
question. Yeah. Sure. So the the question was about a representative democracy um, and how the women uh, provoked participative democracy. I think that that is is clearly um, what the issue is. I think that perhaps it's not so much the way in which these institutions operate, but um, but that simply the kind of options that we have um, on table are, are not really for us. We don't see a lot of young people running for office. Um, we, we see unrealistically high, uh, in some cases, unrealistically high minimum ages to even run for office, which I think itself is a contentious thing. Um, and I think that it's, it's simply what we're, we're witnessing is a bit of a, um, it's, it's a change in tide. I mean, I think that uh, young people are becoming frustrated. I think that um, they have been frustrated for a long time and perhaps in this current moment we see that maybe people are, are listening and, and we'll see how it unfolds. But uh, yeah, certainly I think that the fact that they um, took matters into their own hands, they um, held a lot of consultations with other young people. Um, the fact that a lot of these movements are grassroots is a really important thing. And I think that people, a lot of young people are just simply fed up with, with the hierarchies and the structures that they have to engage. Uh, and they're just creating uh, their own spaces. Uh, we have here a reaction from, let me check here, from Oberi, uh, also raising uh, attention to, to the fact that uh, uh, of the results of the uh, last European elections that we had more young people than ever uh, going going to to vote uh, maybe maybe Christine if you want to to comment a bit on uh, on that how how do you see it and uh, I will uh, open uh, the the possibility there was someone that is not registered with uh, his or her name uh, in a Huawei it's, uh, it's uh, registered as a Huawei, so I suppose it's not uh, the name to, that was asking uh, to have uh, the possibility to, to participate. So you can. Uh, yes, yeah, so the, the question was um, about the last European elections. No, I, I think that that is certainly um, um, something which is a bright spot in terms of, of engaging. I don't think necessarily that young people are throwing away uh, all of these institutions because of course we know that um, for in our systems there is um, an element of also engaging with the way things are. Uh, I think that it's certainly a positive thing that we did have a lot of uh, young people uh, going out to vote. I think it's also for us to reflect in terms of all of the other ways in which young people are needing to be engaged, which is also outside of voting. Um, so surely, yeah, it's not necessarily to be dismissive of um, representative politics as a whole, but really to kind of interrogate a bit um, thinking a little bit outside of the box in the ways in which young people participate and not using voter turnout as the only measure of if young people are engaged in a society or not. I'm collecting some of the, the comments. We got another answer. Uh, we have a, we got another question sorry from from so, someone on the digital digital tools and political participation of young people how can we enhance the political participation of young people with digital tools apart from social media so this question i'm not a digital specialist but i know that there are works underway which are looking at the various ways in which young people um, are also going to be engaged with, say, participatory governance online. And so I know in Brazil, for example, um, various, um, they're trying to set up various vehicles in which young people can um, register their, um, you know, opinions on a particular, a particular budgeting uh, decision online, uh, being able to to get more of their inputs in terms of government decisions. And so this is kind of more of an aspect of e-governance, which I think sort of gets away from simply just asking young people, okay, is the only way for you to get involved online 
uh, to share a post or to like them. Well, no, perhaps there's also ways in which you can uh, reach out directly to, to governments, be able to directly participate in some uh, decision making. So I, I've seen those, but I, I think that it's still an unexplored field. I'm really curious actually what will come in the next few years on that. And I think that um, it's also a way in which we can engage more young people. Um, if that's the way that they would prefer to uh, interact with government, I think that digital tools are really going to be one of the ways, uh, one of the ways forward that we need to look at. Okay, we got here another question from Judith, uh, I think from Hungary. Um, Judith is, is saying that even if uh, uh, she, as a young person, my peers and we experience in institutions, that people in power often blocks uh, their initiatives as, as young people because they fear to, to change it, uh, they fear taking risks. So uh, often uh, ideas coming bottom up to change the ways of operating uh, are many times Kilt is what she, she's mentioning. And uh, she asked, what do you think about this? Have you ever experienced, heard similar, uh, similar stories? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I think that this particular experience is, is definitely not, um, a is not uh, singular. I think that it, it does happen often in any kind of instance where we see young people um, attempting to have greater influence in uh, structures which are, are dominated um, by by certain powers and I think that one thing which perhaps is not talked enough um, about enough is the fact that actually participation and political participation surely is inherently conflictual you know I, I think that there is a lot of responsibility for the powers that be to be able to kind of to challenge themselves to be open up to um, to being challenged to changing their ways of working but of course, when you have established powers, they'll never let go of power easily. You know, I, I think that this is um, this is one thing which perhaps we don't take lightly. And one thing that I would encourage is, you know, the institutions which do have a role, which do have some kind of influence on the way that policymakers operate, the way that organizations operate, um, you know, that they also push for the so-called adults in the room to also do their part. I think that a lot of our participation programming um, in, you know, in the past has focused on what do young people need to do better to have their voices heard. But I think that really the critical question is, what do adults need to do? You know, why is it that we don't have uh, training for, um, for, you know, more training for teachers, for example, to, to be more democratic in their schools or um, other types of institutions? institutions. And I, I think that that is really a critical question is really these adults who are working with young people, how is it that they can be more open? Um, because I think that young people are really, you know, we have to meet them where they are. And it, it then it becomes incumbent on the power holders to be challenged. Okay. Uh, Christina, we, we thank you for, for, uh, for all the questions until now. We are opening now the, the help voting uh, questions. And we have one from Denna, uh, which uh, where, where she's raising, how do you think economic inequality impacts the way in which different groups of young people, um, more, more to less affluent, politically participate? This question could be asked specifically in context of the environmental movement or more broadly. So on the impact of uh, economic inequalities and the way of uh, how it impacts how young people are participating? Well, from the research, there seems to be kind of two sort of ways in which um, we can think about um, young people who are socially excluded and their political participation. On one hand, we do see that uh, young people who have uh, less access to, to economic resources, for example, will often also have less access to other resources, social capital, connections, uh, perhaps even a material things such as uh, internet access, their own laptops, these sorts of things that we would associate with being necessary to be able to fully uh, engage in political life. Yet we also see that in, on the other hand, young people who themselves are perhaps um, socially disadvantaged are also the ones who are going to be the first to, to of their personal experience that they're kind of individualized and see, aha, okay, this is a 
a social issue which has a direct bearing on my life, I'm going to uh, take some action on it because I also want to change my life and also uh, the, the lives of people around me. In the climate movement, of course, um, we do see uh, that um, you know, in a lot of countries where, um, you know, in, for example, in, in northern countries, we do see that the, the climate movement is, is very strong. And that's not to say that it doesn't exist in other countries um, which are less um, economically uh, prosperous. But we do see that, that a lot of the protests are there. And I think that it can reflect a little bit of some of the disadvantages that you have simply uh, when some of your basic needs are being met. I think that when we look intersectionally at how um, disadvantage and uh, social exclusion works, we see that not only is a young person uh, socially disadvantaged uh, as far as their economics, but also um, um, disadvantaged by, by being locked out of, of political conversations such as this. Um, what I think actually, and we see this a little bit, I would point to the United States in terms of the March for Our Lives movement. What we see is actually then the young people who are in the advantage spot, and the ones who are able to have um, their voices heard, the ones who are able to be organized, they have the resources of social capital, they will make an explicit effort to, um, to reach out to those young people who do not have that access and to use their own advantage as a way of bolstering up the others and the voices of others. And so March for Our Lives in the United States, you can see that the white middle class uh, young people who are leading that charge have also used their platform to bolster um, the interrelated issues with uh, police violence and um, Black Lives Matter, for example, and these other disadvantaged groups. So I think that there's ways around it. It's not so simple, um, but, uh, but definitely a, a challenge uh, that we need to think about when thinking about uh, political participation. Um, thank you, Christina. We, we will uh, now bring the, the, the last question since we are approaching the, the end of uh, the, the, the webinar, we promised you one hour, so we are getting there. So this, this question uh, comes from Bruno. Um, so I would perhaps take, uh, take a step back. Uh, does the data support the claim that young people are participating less? I mean, uh, uh, in comparison with previous generations, is it clear that we are really uninterested in taking part in decision making? I do believe this is fundamental fundamental question to be asked at first. And maybe I will raise this, uh, <laughs> this one, which is kind of a, a provocation also for the youth sector is Marty that uh, brought this question, which is saying, uh, why are we still focusing on the traditional structures of uh, participation? And we as a youth uh, sector, and I, I think here uh, to be a youth sector can be understood in many different dimensions, but uh, people working in the youth field, uh, are taking are being slow uh, to recognize develop develop and support new ways of participation is this because we don't know how to do it or we we take safer options such as youth councils uh, so we, we we will have five five minutes to, to get your your answers okay Christina great thank you uh, I'll take the first question first um, I mean we do, it sort of depends on which data and where specifically you're looking at. If we think on aggregate and we think sort of um, average uh, voting data, for example, we do know that, that young people's votes um, are decreasing. How that compares to previous generations, I mean, we'd have to also then control for how large those populations were and also um, for um, voter registration sizes and that kind of thing. But it is, I mean, it is a valid question. Is it something unique to this particular generation at this time or have young people within their own generations always been disaffected? Um, you know, I can, we can think of the 1968 generation in, uh, in Europe as being a particularly active and activist generation and, you know, perhaps we're seeing some parallels to that now. So there's no, there's no um, easy answer to that, but I think that what we are seeing in terms of the discourse um, from a lot of you know, sort of um, uh, commentators on the political 
um, as are always the same. You know, young people are disaffected. They don't care. They only uh, wish to take selfies. They um, are uh, only concerned about themselves. This is the most selfish generation that we've ever had. And I think that really um, part of that is definitional. Part of that is because we are simply not recognizing and not including in our definition the various ways in which young people are participating. And so I think that that is uh, part of the question. For Marty, um, I mean, I think that this is a really good question, and I would hope that this conversation also helps us to uh, raise a, a mirror to ourselves in the youth sector. Um, why is it that we rely only on these traditional structures? I mean, I, I think in some ways it, it is because it, it is partly the way that we've always done it. Um, I think I don't have any easy answers in terms of what would be more innovative. And I also have to say, I don't necessarily think that we need to throw out the baby with the bathwater in the sense of, you know, let's abolish all youth councils. I think that formal representation structures certainly have a place to play. And when we think about formal representation structures and the way in which they interact with policymakers, for example, you know, that is still, regardless if we like it or not, still these formal channels in which policymakers themselves are receptive to. And that we can't ignore. You know, I think that that um, it's always going to be a challenge between do we do politics as usual or do we want to shake things up? I think what's important to ask about the traditional structures which we have are, are they actually as responsive, as democratic or as participatory with young people as we would want them to be? You know, are there, is there space in the way in which decisions are made in these youth structures that can allow a little bit more flexibility and a little bit more um, participatory work with young people. What are the roles of the adults in this? Or is it just prescribed? You know, is the way in which we're operating in these prescribed? And I think that, you know, even in changing some of the daily practices of these otherwise formal institutions, I think could be revolutionary. You know, I, I think that that it could be very interesting to see, you know, even within these processes, how can we be more participatory? So yeah, no easy answers about uh, the, the youth sector there. Uh, thank you very much once again, Cristina. Uh, I think that we, we came to, to the end of this uh, webinar. Uh, I, I would like to share with you some, some uh, next steps. So regarding some questions that were not answered uh, here, we will take them on board and uh, uh, to discuss them most probably or in next webinars or uh, in the symposium itself. Uh, that is going to be held in Strasbourg in September, as I mentioned in the beginning. I also uh, would like to share with you that uh, this webinar, this conversation will be available online so that you can see it afterwards in the link of the symposium page and the partnership website that I'm just sharing with you here in the chat. So you can have access to it here, also to the next webinars. And finally, um, I, I would like to, to, to invite you for the next webinar that is going to be held on the 23rd of August uh, at the same hour, so uh, one o'clock uh, Central European time, and uh, will be on how political is youth work. So uh, please, uh, join us. Uh, we are here also to, I, I'm getting here a message saying to, to research on, uh, check the research on values uh, as part of the perspective on youth uh, and uh, it's uh, Lyman that is sharing it with us. And that is a, uh, which was actually the topic of the first uh, webinar and uh, Zafirish from Greece is asking that the date is the 23rd of August, 1 p.m. Central European time, and it's also a Friday. A Friday, and I shared with you the link uh, on the symposium page, uh, and you can uh, have access to it on the partnership uh, website as well. Um, I'm getting here. And information. <laughs> oh. 
opportunities for so uh, I once again thank you very much Christina and thank you all for uh, joining us uh, thank you Limonas for uh, for your work and uh, Marta for joining us as well I we will close now uh, the the webinar and uh, I think that's 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 all no Limonas <laughs> we can close it yeah Christina Marta thank you thank you all for joining thank us you all. see you in the next one thank you